Pages of Pim Better Podcast. Greetings, Voyagers. Welcome to the Voyages of Tim Vetter podcast. This is episode number 155. This is day 37 of isolation in New York. This is another one of those kind of Easter egg type of episodes for me in that I get to talk to somebody that I've been wanting to talk to for quite some time. If you're tuning in for the first time, this isn't a, a music news podcast or even a music podcast. I've had music-themed episodes, but mostly in the context of places that I've traveled to. I think the first one was in Bali in Indonesia. But along the way, I've been able to reach out to some people that had always kind of inspired me or I was curious in, like Jeff, who's been on here a few times. And in the early days, I was fortunate enough to, to get to, to talk to Scott Vogel, who obviously is like, uh, like one of the godfathers within you know, the genre. So those were always really cool. But I've had, you know, I've had access to people now. A lot of people are home and looking for things to do, and I've been able to, you know, take something good out of this pandemic and, you know, use part of that to my advantage. So I don't necessarily, again, use it in a way to talk about like, hey, this is what's coming out, but more so in a way to sort of tell a story about the person's life. I really like to talk about their entry into music and the early days and things like that. So uh, it's fun for me to, to talk about old shows and reminisce a bit. So maybe in a way that it's quite selfish that I get to talk to some of these people, but hopefully they inspire you and um, you know you get to discover some new music if you haven't heard of the artists before, or you get to learn a bit a little bit a little bit about the uh, the artists if you're already a fan. So today's episode is with Vinny Caruana of. The Movie Life, I Am the Avalanche. Uh, he is also his own artist because he puts out his own records under Vinnie Caruana, some solo stuff. And um, he's got two other projects, Constant Elevation and Peaced Out. So I'll have a few of those in here. I'll mention those in just a second. But you know, my relationship to his music is that The Movie Life is one of the first, I guess, kind of local bands that I started to see local maybe is the wrong word because they, they had a, I think this time next year came out on revelation. And so they were already, you know, within the genre had like a deal, right? Like had a record out on a label that a lot of people respected. So I guess when I, when I think of like other local bands that I first started to see the first show I ever really went to by myself, I walked to cause it was in a backyard in my town. There's a, a pop punk band playing. I think that, I think one of the members went to my high school even, uh, but they were called the John Stamos project and they played a show. I can't remember exactly who played, but some of the bands I started to see around that time were like the backup plan. Uh, there was a band that was called maybe tomorrow that I liked. Um, who else? Blood red. There was a band, uh, become one. Her Last Words is a band that if uh, people were listening to the movie Life probably knew. Uh, obviously, like Scraps and Heart Attacks, This Is Hell. So those are all like local local bands. But I think by the time I started to see the movie Life, they were already doing tours. Yeah, and Vinny actually added to like my memory of the first time seeing them. So that'll come up in a little bit. But that was actually, that was with a tour with some bands that were, at least I think Grade was pretty well known. But yeah, I mean, I didn't really... I participated in this scene as like a consumer, I guess, or somebody that went to shows, but I didn't really come into my own socially until I was older. So I talked to and interacted with my small group of friends, but uh, was a bit shy and so didn't didn't talk to as many people back then. And now I get to make up for lost time and, and talk to some of the bands that uh, I really, really liked when I was younger. Vinny's music has really held up over time, though. I like everything that the movie Life has put out, that I Am the Avalanche has put out. I really like the Aging Frontman um, EP that he put out in the fall. So you can go to the show notes for this episode, as always. And when I say show notes, folks, I'm talking about just go into your app and you'll see like the description portion and you'll see links to check out Vinny's music. Please go buy stuff. You know, right now, obviously a lot of people are struggling but, you know, working class blue collar bands and 
you know, independent artists and, and punk musicians are living, you know, album to album, performance to performance. So a lot of people need help now. And you listener too might be like, hey man, I need help. So I get it. If you can't, you can't. But if you can go out and buy some music because um, that goes a long way to making sure that these artists are still around once this pandemic is, is gone. I'm going to play two songs also. Instead of the interlude music, you'll hear two songs back to back and that will lead you into the, the conversation that we have. I wanted to give you a little bit of a contrast if you're not familiar with Vinny. So the first song is going to be off of um, the Pieced Out record that just came out called Feelings Blade. And that's the first song off that record. We talk about this in the episode, so that's why I wanted to play it. It's called A Long Way Back to Civilization. It's a little like a little spacey uh, meets heavy hardcore. Um, And then right after that, will be the song Better, which is like singer-songwriter stuff off of that EP I just mentioned, Aging Frontman. So you get to see a pretty cool contrast in um, the different styles that Vinny plays. I think both of those songs are really cool. So check those out, and then, like I said, go out and buy those, buy some merch, support them. You can also support this podcast by going to my Patreon. That is patreon.com slash the voyages of Tim Vetter. And that goes a long way to keeping these episodes coming. You know, I've really, like I said, been fortunate to put out some really cool and interesting stuff, at least to me, in the last month or so. But I'm like so, so itchy to get back overseas or even to get around the country and and to meet some people in some other places and to record some cool, you know, um, regional-based episodes to give you uh, maybe a flavor of something that, that you're not used to. So, you know... All that is to say that the the Patreon goes towards that, to keeping these episodes coming. All right, folks, enjoy these two songs and enjoy the conversation with Vinny.
to the situation as far as making lemonade out of a fucked up situation. Um, obviously, it sucks for everyone. Some worse than others. There's people lying in hospital beds right now, hooked up to a ventilator, not knowing if they'll ever get off of it. So anybody's inconveniences and problems are fucking dust compared to compared to the hardship to some folks, but, um, for me, um, the, I've been writing and recording and I'm the avalanche record for a while. And the recording happened over the course of like two months. And so nobody really pays you to record when you're a like punk musician. Yeah. You're not like, you know, you're, you're, you're sacrificing your own time to, to, for your art. Um, and punk bands make money, you know, going and playing shows and having people support buying records, buying, buying vinyl, buying t-shirts and shit. So it was kind of bad timing <laughs> for a lot of people. There is no good timing, but, uh, May was going to be my month to kind of pick me back up and get me going again financially after all of like the create creative times. Um, so I had some solo shows, some movie life shows, some avalanche shows. We were going to the UK to do a full avalanche tour. 
basically just like, yes, May is going to be the most fun month of the year. It's going to be amazing. Um, so obviously none of that's happening. Um, the bright side is that all of that creative work and all that time we put into writing and recording the avalanche record paid off because we finished tracking like one day before everybody went into quarantine in New York. So the bright side is we have a full length record that's done and that's fucking amazing. Cause I'd be going nuts right now if we had to wait like another year or whatever to record this or however long this takes. So that's really cool. You recorded uh, three records across projects, right? Like right before this hit? So the Peace Out record's been finished for like five years. Whoa, okay. <laughs> we kind of finished it and then sat on it. Um, I made some changes to it late last year. Things I wanted to fix when, I, when we revisited it. Um, but for the most part, we recorded it a while ago. And those guys out in California, the rest of the band, were, were just like, yo, go and listen to this record. First of all, they, they went and got it mastered after I made my changes. Like, go and listen to this record and tell me that it doesn't make more sense this year to release this than it did five years ago. So I went and listened to it and I'm just like, this is a great record. Like, this is fucking good. And, and I, I could stand like away from it. Like, I felt like I was just a fan of it being like, oh, this is this amazing, cool, weird record. Um, and then, so yeah, that's out. The um, Avalanche full length is out. Uh, I'm sorry. Avalanche full length is finished being recorded. We're figuring out how to release it now. Um, and a live solo record um, recorded at like the last show of my UK tour um, is finished as well. And then Constant Elevation, my hardcore band, we have uh, a four song EP that's also been recorded like before the new year. So all this <laughs> stuff of like not knowing why you're recording this shit and not know, like not really having a gun to our head in any respect, it was all done like on our own kind of time and our own volition. It all happened. Um, it all, you know, we managed to get all of it done before this hit. So that's just some cosmic shit in that respect. So there's the lemonade, you know? That Peace Out record is really cool. Uh, I saw that like Brooklyn Vegan, I guess, is streaming that for a little bit. And I checked that out. Even that, it's that maybe this sounds weird, but that first track with like the the talking over part, it feels a little like dystopian and futuristic and spacey. And like, I know that sounds a bit weird, but it does feel quite appropriate for this time. And that, that shit's pretty heavy too, man. Like that's a, that's a really cool record. You should be proud of that. Thank you. Yeah. Does that stuff, um, oh, we, let me pause for a second. There we go. What's that? No, I just glitched out for a second. We're okay though. Um, yeah, the pieced out record, I, I'm just talking over weird sounds and, um, the first, the first thing I say on that record as I'm talking underneath the noise, I just say, the library's closed. All white people must leave. And that's the first, that's the, and so I think that sets the tone, uh, of a funky record. Yeah. <laughs> does that stuff, um, does that scratch it? Does each project scratch a different itch or do you get the same satisfaction out of, out of all the, the, the projects you're on? Everything's different for me. It's a different feeling in my brain and in my soul. Each one feels different. Pieced Out feels the most different because it's fucking out there. Um, Pieced Out, I don't write the music either. Um, so I'm like a kind of passenger. Like I fit myself into like a work of art that those guys make. Um, so that feels different. Yeah, everything feels different. I mean, a Avalanche is like this brotherhood. Um more so than any like project I've ever been a part of. Um, Avalanche is all like best buds and like it's really, truly a brotherhood. Um, the song feels, you know, and, and I write the, I write those songs with Mike Ireland and that's the, that's the, that's how we get Avalanche. Um, you know, movie life, it's me and Brandon Riley. We write together. 
we have been since we were fucking, uh, since a long time ago. And, um, yeah, Constant Elevation feels totally different. It's the only band I play in that's super fast and, and kind of reminds me of the music I grew up listening to, like fast, hardcore, melodic, hardcore, shit like that. So yeah, it all it all feels different. Um, it all kind of completes me in its own way and it all kind of like sums me up as like at least my artistic side, you know? Yeah. It's interesting right now because obviously there, there's no... There's no venues that people can do, go to, and a lot of people are hopping on like live performances and IG live type of stuff, which is really mm-hmm. cool for me. Also, like feels in some instances a bit surreal because like I was watching yeah. um, like Matt Pryor does a, a couple a week, and you know I'm I'm 33 now. I think the first time I saw the Get Up Kids, I was like 13 or 14 in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and now I'm watching like Matt Pryor with his own kids on his porch drinking a beer, playing music. And I mean, obviously that boundary between, you know, band and audience member, if we're talking about punk and hardcore and indie music, like the physical boundary has always been quite small, but also the access to artists has been a lot greater than if you were, I don't know, listening to something that's like arena bands or something like that. But how are you finding the experience? Because I think that, that your performances have been really cool. Thank you. Um, I have been doing the same thing. Like I've been a patron kind of an, or an attendee in other shows. Me and my wife have been tuning into um, mostly DJ sets. Like, Hey, we're cooking dinner. Like, and like people that just, we want to be in the same room as, or just kind of want to hang out with. Um, And it does feel that way. So, I think the people that are tuning into my shows that I've been doing from my living room are, they feel like they're hanging out and I see them talking to each other. People are lonely. You know what I mean? Like I am, we all are like, I'm quarantined with my wife. And so we have each other, but we're still lonely. We don't get to see our family or our loved ones. We don't get to do normal human stuff right now. And like, you know, it, it, I know that it's different, but it does still feel like I went to go and watch um, Mike Ireland who plays in I am the avalanche. Um, I watched him do a solo set from his living room and a bunch of our friends like joined in and we were all writing to each other, fucking with each other and shit. And that felt good. You know, um, the, it feels obviously different doing it this way, but this is all we have right now. And the connection that we're, we're having and the the moment that we're having together is still real. Um, is it surreal? Maybe a little bit because this whole situation is surreal, but, um, it, this, this is, it's me, you know, I, I've actually been lucky enough to do this kind of thing long before we were forced into doing it. So I had some experience playing shows on stage and stuff. So, um, you know, I, and, and, and another thing that's been really like a lemonade situation is like, people are, I mean, people are writing to me being like, make sure you got to play this. And it's like, if I'm on stage and someone shouts out a, a song that I'm not prepared to perform, that's one thing. It's another thing for me to be able to go, you know what? I have to like go over that and like kind of practice it and kind of relearn it a little bit because I have so many songs in my kind of career, (laughs) but I can do that. I can be like, all right. Cause I play every Thursday afternoon at three o'clock New York time. And then I play every Sunday evening, seven o'clock New York time. So the three o'clock, um, show weekday shows are, I would say there are probably 60, 70% people from the UK and Europe because they're, they finish mm. dinner. It's eight o'clock. It's nine o'clock. They're like chilling, pouring a beer, hanging out. And then we do a similar thing for the people in the U S and, you know, sometimes people in Australia tune in and like, 
really early in the morning and like pour a cup of coffee and watch me play like on, on Sunday night. So it's kind of cool. Like I can go, you know what, come to the next show. I'll play it. I'll practice it. So I've added at least 10 songs in the last month, songs that I've never, I have never played or songs that I, um, played once 10 to 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, like, so now I'm like adding to my arsenal. Like when I go out and play solo shows after this, like I'm going to have a list of like 50, 60 songs probably to pick from for a set list that I'm ready to go with, like on a solo level. Cause you know, not everything works with an acoustic guitar and sometimes you need to make it work. Sometimes you need to not and just leave it where it is. And like, I'm learning all that shit now. So it's been cool. It's been a good exercise. I'm getting better. I'm becoming a better musician and, um, and um and that's all thanks to the people that are like tuning in and like pushing me to to work and 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 you know what else do I have to do but sit here and learn a movie life song from twenty years ago like let's try it I you know i uh, I got all the time in the world, aside from little walks, we live in a very dense we live in the green point uh like the historic green point uh neighborhood in um in Brooklyn and it's pretty dense here and it's, 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 it's quite a, um, we love our neighborhood. It's, it's like a walking neighborhood. There's like, you know, people are out in our neighborhood, yeah. tons of bars, restaurants, parks, the, the river's right here. So there's just beautiful views of the city. So everybody wants to get out of their apartment and take a walk, which we do as much as we can. If it's a shitty day like today, we skip it. But like, it's tough out here. You get, you go on the sidewalk and like, I'm walking in the street trying to avoid people and shit. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a little bit complicated, you know, it's, we kind of wish we were, we were quarantined in the country or some shit. I don't know if that would make us go crazy or not, but like, I don't like being around all these people. Not everyone's being smart. There's still people standing on the corner talking to each other, no masks, no nothing. A lot of people are being smart. Um, but my wife and I got sick. We got this virus. Um, we're through it now. Like we're totally back. Um, our smell and our taste, um, still hasn't completely returned, but, um, we're tasting shit. We're tasting some, some shit and we're, there's like certain things we can't smell and there's certain shit we can smell. And there's certain things that we can taste about certain things. And then there's other shit that just tastes weird still. But I just want to say that to like a jogger that jogs like comes up from behind me and just passes me with like a foot distance. I just want to be like, dude, I've had this fucking virus. Like, if you knew that, you think you might be a little fucking smarter about like, I don't know. I'm just venting because it's just, it's, it's scary. It's scary in the city and a lot more people are going to get sick. Um, and I see that they're trying to reopen the economy and reopen certain towns and cities and states and shit. And I get that because certain states haven't really been affected by this much. But watch these rallies, these like pro, um, these like anti, you know, these rallies like against coronavirus and against like closures where all these people are standing together. Watch these numbers spike just from these rallies. This shit ain't over. We're going to get a massive second wave. Take it from me. I'm in the fucking epicenter of this disease. <laughs> this is like the epicenter of this disease. This virus is in the United States and the epicenter of the United States is New York city uh, for this thing. I can, I, I can see the way people are acting. And as the nicer it gets outside, people don't fucking act until, until it affects them. I used to drive like a fucking asshole. Until I was in a van wreck on tour and we rolled over and I was fucking lucky to survive. I started being a real cautious driver after that. People aren't affected. The shit isn't real to them until they're immediately affected by it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? As soon as somebody dies, as soon as they see their community start to crumble, like that's when they, they'll fucking act. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant, but unfortunately, I don't think this thing's going to end until there's a vaccine because uh human beings are fucking idiots some of them so 
Yeah, I get the New York thing, man. I live by the by the Hughes stop, like in South Williamsburg. And yeah, like mm-hmm. there's people at the parks every day. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. It like yeah, and, and they're gonna reopen the economy and like sacrifice human lives to save the US economy. And it's like <laughs> All right. Are you gonna sacrifice your life, Mr. Trump? Are you willing to fucking, are you willing to go? No? Oh, okay. You know what I mean? You pointed out something before though, Vinny. Like I even had this conversation last week with, uh, with Jacob Bannon. And like uh, probably a lot of people would be like, wow, like they have, you know, at least the perception would be like, wow, they have major crossover appeal, right? Into like mainstream heavy music. Um, but he's still very much like, no, man, we're, a, we're a working class band. We're like, you know, people work paycheck to paycheck. It's like album to album. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, have you, have you lived the majority of your life that way while, while in bands, have you had side gigs and like, uh, you know, like quote unquote normal jobs? Um, <clears throat> I've had jobs, um, throughout my career, um, I'm definitely a working class musician. Um, and yeah, sometimes it's paycheck to paycheck. Sometimes it gets real rough. Um, it's a lot of ups and downs. Um, I regret nothing about what I've done with my life. Um, the last 20 years or so have been fucking amazing, even though that some of them have been hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've bartended, I've done construction. Um, early on, I, I had the same job from when I was like 13 to like 21. So Movie Life started touring when I was like 19. I'm 40 now. Um, so yeah, for the first two years, I was working in a batting range. I used to ride my bike to from my parents' house. Whoa. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm so busy right now. And the reason I'm being so prolific with all these releases and all these projects is because I don't have a day job. It requires me to hustle more and do so many different things to try and generate income with through music. But um, I, I wouldn't have any of these records. None of this shit would have got done if I was bartending three, four nights a week in the city. When I was bartending, I'll tell you the exact, I'll tell you the exact timeline of, bar, of me bartending. The exact timeline of me bartending is Avalanche subtitle record all the way up until, which ha- which came out in 2005, 2004, 2005, all the way up until 2011 when Avalanche United came out. Guess when I was bartending? That whole fucking time wow. where I wasn't applying myself. I wasn't writing music because... Last call is four in the morning. You don't have to clean in and count money and shit. You get home five, five thirty, six in the morning, and then you got to sleep, and then you got to wake up the next day, eat some food, and go back to work and bartend again. I wasn't getting any, there was no creativity happening. There was no time for it. Um, so that, that's kind of like the, that's, that's just, that's the, like, how it went. So, um, people used to blame drive through and shit for like us not releasing a record and all this shit. Cause the first records on drive through and they kind of went into a funk and all this shit. No, we were all bartending, making money, like partying in the city and just not making time for creativity. And luckily I snapped out of it, um, and started making a ton of records since then between 2011 and now I'm, I'm happy to look back on what I've achieved. Yes, it's interesting, man, because I think like would you mentioned like 19 year old Vinny playing in the movie life. Did you ever expect to have this longevity? Like, you know, I've never been in a band, but I would, you know, I've I've been going to shows since I was a kid. And, you know, most bands that that I see, I think they're just they're happy to play shows, you know, for for a year or two or put out an album. That's all it was, really. Um like these milestones and these goals just start to grow once you start believing in yourself and then you start seeing people believe in you and then you're like, Hmm. So it's just this gradual thing where you, in the beginning I was used to 
being in a band, playing on Long Island, every so often we'd play in like New Jersey or like we'd play like a weekend show somewhere else at a Long Island. But my only thing was like being a part of the Long Island scene that like kind of helped raise me as a teenager. And like, so just being a part of that and playing some shows on Long Island and having my friends sing along to some, like people singing along to a song was the first goal. (laughs) And then, and then that happened. People started singing along Long Island. We'd play three, 400 people would come out and the shows would be crazy. And then what's the next goal? We want to make a full length record. And then we did that. And then Revelation Records heard our, we sent our full length to everybody. Revelation heard it. Oh, now that's the new achievement. We're going to sign to Revelation Records. Holy shit. Like That's what I grew up listening to. Fucking Yuta Today, Girl This Kids Judge, fucking Quicksand. Like. And then... um and then you're on tour and you're like, oh shit. And that, and then you're like, all right, what are we doing here? Are we going to take this to the next level? It's like, we got to take it to the next level. And then drive through records comes knocking. We have a worldwide fan base already. Drive through comes knocking. Listen, or uh, movie life gets into a van wreck. We destroy our van and our trailer and a lot of our equipment. Drive through comes knocking. Hey, you could sign a deal with drive through records. It's a major label su- subsidiary. We got a bunch of cash. We got great distribution. We got a sick roster. We'll buy you a new van, new trailer. Wow. Uh, you know, this and that get you on your feet. Cool. Now we're like, oh, fuck. We're, our, our record is like in every store in the fucking country. This record label that we're on is fucking exploding. There's like gold records and shit happening. Newfound is popping off. Midtown's popping off. RX Bandits, Movie Life. Um, Finch is starting to explode. Um, starting Line, all that shit happened. Like so many, like so much success happened in that short period of time. And like the combination of like the grassroots kind of hard work we did in the beginning. And like, it was always grassroots hard work, but like, the exposure that we got towards the end, which would be like the drive through era until when we broke up, all that shit laid the groundwork for me still being able to do this now. Mm. Um, I'll always play new music and people are cool about getting into my new music and shit, but like I'll always play some old shit too. And like that shit, you know, is kind of the backbone of like my relationship it's it's like the it's the foundation of my relationship with the people that have kind of like stuck with me throughout the years and it's not a huge fan base around the the world that I have as like a solo artist or like even my bands but the people that are down are super fucking down which I appreciate till like forever I, I I never take that for granted do you ever think about or reflect on like how strange it is if you take Long Island, right? Like this one chunk of rock and you look at all of the bands, like from your, from your era, like the bands you've been in and like some of your, uh, I don't know if you'd call them colleagues, contemporaries, but like, uh, like off the cuff, right? So like, like glass jaw, taking back Sunday, brand new, um, you can talk about even bands that maybe didn't have the same amount of exposure, but had almost like a, a cult like following on Long Island, like Kill Your Idols, or like On the Might of Princes. I remember, yeah, cr- Crime and Stereo. Crime and Stereo. I-, I think I was like 14 when uh, Sky Came Falling released 1021, which was to me like way, way, way ahead of its time. And you know, a lot of the a lot of these records came out when people are in their their like early 20s. Do you ever reflect on that and and think of like what that was, like what was in the water? Yeah, um, I do. It's definitely wild, um, but I do have some insight on it. It it wasn't just a time and place. Um, It wasn't just a time and place where like a bunch of like teenagers and kids in their early 20s like, just decided to be good (laughs) and make this kind of, and kind of like contribute to an overall kind of genre for a while. Um, It had a lot to do with like our forefathers on Long Island, like 
there were some really incredible bands that a lot of people um, that are into bands like Movie Life and Take Back Sunday, Brand New, Glass Jaw, Crime Stereo, like every, everybody. Like, so like when these bands would play, you could see videos of it like on YouTube and shit. These bands would be playing and it'll be Movie Life, Glass Jaw, Brand New, Take Back Sunday, Crime Stereo, Reunion Show, um, On the Might of Princes. We're all in the crowd singing along to these bands. And these band, these are bands. Some of them, um, Silent Majority is probably the number one. They were they're the pretty much un, like undisputed kings of Long Island. Anybody from our era will tell you that. There's definitely no movie life without Silent Majority. Um, I took everything I learned from Silent Majority going to watch them as like a kid. Um, and when I started movie life, I was definitely emulating what Tommy was doing and. I was pushing things to go in that melodic hardcore kind of way, um, at least as much as I could. And like Mind Over Matter is another band that like definitely were like 15 years ahead of their time. Um, Vision of Disorder, huge influence on a lot of us. Those are the Vision of Disorder are the guys that like went on tour for real and like got out there and toured around the world to the point where like, when movie life started touring, it was like, yo, they're doing it. Like we can do it. Like we're still young. Like nobody's in college or anything. Like, let's try, you know, like we look at them and like, as like a inspiration, like we can go on tour. Um, so that, that was part of it. Like we were all part of the scene watching some incredible bands. And the fact that the scene had grown so much because of the bands from long Island that were playing that could draw 500 people on their own. We didn't need any national touring acts. But when that did happen, people started skipping New York City, come play Long Island, thousand people would show up. Um, and bands started figuring that out. Like, yo, this is where it's at. Um, there's tons of kids here and they're all like into this. So um, yeah, I think, I think all of us being in the crowd watching all those like Long Island legends that we came up on was super helpful in kind of forming us as like, we like kind of took off with our bands and like the direction that we all took. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that I was, one of the things I like to do when I have musicians on, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not like a music news podcast or anything like that. You know, I've had like political people on here, chefs. So some people are going to tune in cause it's Vinny and, and some people are going to tune in just because they're, they're faithful listeners. But I was trying to think, I like to nerd out about the early days and I'm going to, I'm going to get into your past in a second, a little deeper, but I was thinking back to like my first exposure to, to your music. And there's, there's two things that come to mind. I saw, and you were making me think of this when you were talking about just like how, how like stacked these shows were back in the day without people Mm -hmm. maybe even realizing it. But the first time I saw the movie life was at the Babylon Legion hall. And I don't remember everyone that played, but like the first band was, uh, so one of your, your bandmates, brothers, Travis's first band, the heist before they were scraps and heart attacks. I think mm-hmm. the second band on that was a little, a little band by the name of American nightmare who had like either just the demo or the, the self-titled seven inch out. Uh, I think yeah. it was overthrows like last show, maybe. Um, this was, um, this, I remember this was a movie life headlining. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I remember this show cause this was. I don't know. It wasn't a record release. I remember this show. So we were, um, movie life was on tour with grade and the impossibles. Yes, 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 yes. And, um, we were like opening that tour. We had just started to kind of break through. Like we were signed to drive through, but nothing had been released yet. And, um, so we were, we were opening the grade and the impossibles tour, but we had been drawing a lot of people on long Island, uh, early on. And so we told grade and the impossibles, we were like, we should headline the long Island show. I think it would be best for everyone. If we headlined at the same time, American nightmare and the heist were playing too. So I think what we did was we combined the shows so that we didn't take away. And we had known American nightmare already. Like, Strangely enough, I mean, back in the day, mixed bills were a lot more common. And like 
Movie Life played tons of hardcore shows, like playing with Kill Your Idols and Strike Anywhere and Striking Distance and Reach the Sky and American Nightmare. And so we probably, you know, most likely we just reached out to them and said, hey, why don't we combine the shows? It'll be cool. Um, I remember doing that. And I remember that being a huge fucking show. That was cool. Yeah, I, I when I think back to that time, I sometimes mix up like, so I can think of like bands I've seen at at the Legion, and I I totally forgot that Grade was on that show. I loved Grade, but like I yeah, I, I, no, mi- I, I mix up shows too. Like I, I'll I'll mix up two different days completely. Yeah, it's hard, man. So much shit to remember. Like I was like super fortunate that my dad did a lot of things right. So he always he always made sure I was working. So even you know at thirteen, I used to babysit. I umpired like t ball games. And I'd have a little bit of money. And like back then when you had $20, like that $20 meant you had like a really big decision to make with what you were going to do with the $20 because you might not have another $20 for a week or so. And he was he, he was super cool that I had some friends in like Babylon, the West Babylon area, and he would drive me just to go hang out with them. And so I would go, you know, I would go to those shows at the Legion, but he would also drive me to Looney Tunes. And I can remember, this is like, there's like some message board stuff at the time, but it's really kind of like pre-internet as we know it now. And so access to bands would be through like word of mouth or compilations or going to a show and finding out about a band. And some of my friends from Babylon had like mentioned the movie life. And I remember going to Looney Tunes and like flipping through and you see all these things and you have to make a decision sometimes having never heard the band before, but just kind of going on what people told you. And I remember buying this time next year, and that, that was sort of my my gateway then into the movie life and your music. And you have a, you have a couple years on me, so your your exposure to bands was uh, was before my time. But this is it's it's really cool to get to talk to you because the movie life was, in a sense, like one of the gateway bands for me. Like I had been listening to a lot of stuff through like like Fat and Epitaph just through compilations. Uh, right. Because you'd get exposure to Yeah, like, compilations were a huge, you know, skate videos, snowboard videos, surfing videos, yeah. compilations, shit like that. That that was huge for me too. Was there a particular gateway band that got you into like punk and hardcore and underground kind of stuff? I'd say it's Vision of Disorder. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, VOD is from North Merrick, where I'm from, and I have older brothers. Uh, they're three and four years older than me. And so my older brothers grew up with the VOD guys, and my older brother had a band too, so they would play together all the time. So my first show, I, like my first show, and then probably the next 10, 15, 20 shows was VOD. Wow. <laughs> because... I was 11, 12 years old when I started going to shows. The reason I was allowed to do that was only if one VOD and my brother's band were playing and two, if my brothers agreed to like, you know, sometimes my brothers would be like, just, we don't listen. I'm like, we want to have our own fun. We don't have, want to have to like look after him today. So sometimes I just didn't go, but sometimes they were cool enough to like, let me in, like, let me into this world. And, um, the vision of disorder and my brother's band had, um, was called the warped weeble wobbles. Oh yeah, dude. They were like, um, for the people listening that don't know this, they were a fucking anomaly. They were basically, obviously they were a joke band. They're called the warped weeble wobbles. They're a total high school band that, the Warp Weeble Wobble is like the nickname for like their math teacher in high school. And they were so endearing and their songs were catchy too. And their songs were all joke songs, like really funny lyrics and shit. And they caught on in Long Island in a big way. I mean, they, their last show was like fucking huge. And um, so the Warp Weeble Wobbles and VOD are like, my whole gateway into punk. And then the first band I got into, like the first bands I got into that weren't them were Minor Threat and Sick of It All. Those were like my Minor Threat, Sick of It All, and then you start getting into 
finding newer hardcore and then digging into the older stuff that already happens, you know. Do you have memories of, or like music memories pre punk and, in, in, and independent music? Like were, were your parents playing stuff around the house? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, growing up, there was, um, the band has always been a constant with my family, Bob oh, cool. Dylan's band, the band. Um, the band has always been huge. Um, it's always been something that everyone in our family just listens to and really like kind of connects with, um, a lot of Beatles, um, a lot of queen. Um, and then we started getting into like looking into like heavy rock and stuff. We started getting into kiss, um, Judas priest. Ozzy Osbourne Sabbath kind of stuff um a lot of Paul Simon my mom's like my mom loves Simon and Garfunkel so like a lot of Paul Simon and a lot of Steely Dan shit like that that's the kind of shit I, I remember and I listen to all that stuff now I like came back around to all of that and uh I listen to a lot of Steely Dan a lot of Paul Simon I, I listen to a lot of Grateful Dead um that, that's kind of the stuff I, from when I was young. And then when I started, and then we got into hip hop really young um, because groups like Public Enemy and De La Soul um, were from like our area. And um, so, yeah, like 19, I got into rap like when I was like nine years old and it's just, I knew every word to every Public Enemy record, Slick Rick, De La Soul's first record came out in maybe 89. So right around there, nine, 10 years old, I got like my first, me finding my own music, that was all rap for wow. like two or three years before I started getting into like alternative rock, Faith No More, Alice in Chains, you know, like all the early sub pop shit. And that, and that like Pantera, and shit like that. And then through alternative rock and the heavy rock and shit like that, we crossed into punk and then hardcore. You can hear, I saw your curated list of like what you've been listening to, you know, during the, during the pandemic. And you can hear those influences and some of those uh, early musical listenings that you just mentioned, sort of like uh, pre-hip-hop, what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Were you like, so you, like you can sing, sing, right? Um, I don't know, you know, I know some folks even in, in the world of, of like underground music and, and punk have taken, have taken voice lessons and things like that. I'm not sure if you have, but were you always confident right away to, when you started playing solo shows or was that, was there any fear there in, in branching out and uh, being the only person up there? As far as solo, I, I have taken lessons here and there. Um, basically, the people who give these lessons, like they totally deserve it, but I cannot afford to pay like $300 for an hour, $300 an hour for a lesson. I'm trying to just pay rent in New York City, you know. Um, but luckily, like someone like Melissa Cross, who... Um, Melissa Cross is like the one. She's like a gnarly vocal coach. She coaches a lot of people on the heavier side. Mm. Um, but I, I'm kind of like in the middle there. Um, and I do yell and I do kind of shout. And so Melissa Cross, I went and had one lesson with. And, and a lot of the things that she teaches um, are things that you kind of apply at home and you practice and you like kind of work on her lessons, you know you work on your own. So that's the kind of thing I did. Um, answer as far as solo shows, it took me a long time to feel confident with solo shows. Really? For real. Like took me a while. Yeah. It took me a while. Like I, 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 I had never played guitar in front of anyone before that. Like literally never played guitar in front of a crowd. Wow. So it's like, and then you got to think about, you know, I've never sung any of these songs. Cause when I started playing solo shows, I was just playing avalanche and movie life songs. So, When I started, I had never played guitar and sang these songs at the same time. So that took a lot of getting used to. Um, 
And my confidence grew throughout the, you know, every show I would just figure out like ways to be a solo artist. I, I knew I had to talk a lot more and I need, I knew I needed to like, you know, there was no symbols and feedback and shit to hide behind. Um, but I, I really love it. Like i it was extremely liberating starting to play solo shows. I could do whatever I want, you know, fuck around and just play whatever. Um, but no, in the beginning, it, I'd, I'd say it took me a few years until I was super confident with it. Now I feel completely at home holding a guitar, standing in front of a crowd. That's cool. You know, you mentioned VOD. Uh, the biggest VOD fan I know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know him, but uh, Brian Audley grew up in Center Reach. He, he plays in... Yeah, man, the band. He's, he's a friend. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, you live in the same neighborhood. Um yeah, he's a friend and neighbor. Okay, cool, cool. Cool. Yeah, so he's the he's the biggest VOD fan I know, but he had made a comment about oh man, maybe this is like ten years ago at this point, but he had made a comment about brand new that their music matured with like the physical maturation of their fan base in the terms mm-hmm. in terms of the the evolution of their sound. And I think that right. um Maybe it, I guess it came out in October, huh? But Aging Frontman I think is a is a really wonderful record, and there's a thank you. There's a level of maturity with the sound and with the content that you know I can start to relate to as I'm uh, getting up here in 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 years as well. Um, but I wonder, cool. like, That's awesome. yeah, yeah, and just also just you know the music and sonically, it's. I really love it, man. Like it's really great. I'm not just saying that because you're on here. I was listening to that a lot back in, in like November and December. Even like coming home from work, I would go, uh, yeah. r- I would go run at the gym, and maybe it's 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 a good winter record. Yeah, it it's is. Not too many. There's not too many rays of sunlight on that. <laughs> but I wonder, like, um, I know, like, you're immensely happy with, you know, where the trajectory of the music is taking you, and with the exposure it's given you to, you know, to, to different countries and different people and like a really fruitful and fulfilling life. But are there, do you feel as if there's been any drawbacks? I don't know if, you know, if physically, if there's a, if there's a, an an impact, you know, on your voice and your throat after singing for, for 20 plus years, are there any, are there any, any, any rough spots that come with 20 plus years of playing music? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the normal kind of security that someone has when they start their career, when they leave college and they're building their 401k and they're buying houses and they're making investments and like the things, those, those are the things that I didn't do. I could never do. Um, so there's, those are like little things, you know, and you know, like there's, there's stuff like that where, you know, you have to accept that that's just not in it. You know, not that, I mean, listen, there's plenty of musicians that are like fucking well off and have tons of security and have, you know, but I've just never been one. Like I've always been a working class musician. I've never like had my big break. I'm not looking for my big break. I'm just doing my thing. You know what I mean? Um, so that kind of stuff, you know, is, uh, is, you know, it's kind of, you kind of take that with all the good shit. Um, as far as my voice, like my voice feels good. It feels strong. I think I'm doing it better than I ever have. Um, I don't smoke or do any sort of inhaling of anything anymore. Um, that being said, like, I think that kind of helps. Like I used to smoke tons of weed and, um, I feel like my voice, I was losing my voice and, and, you know, wondering why, you know, um, everyone's body is different. You know, certain dudes can like fucking take up five bomb bong rips and then play a two hour set and like sing at the top of their lungs and then like go and party and like drink a bottle of whiskey, not sleep, wake up the next day, sound check and be fine. I'm not one of those people. Um, I got to look after my voice. Um, you know, there's, I just, I just have all my tricks, man. Like I, I drink so much water. I'm such a water drinker. Um, I like to have a cocktail. I like to have a beer and shit, but like, I always make sure that like, I'm staying super hydrated. Um, and I just, and I just like to stay on top of my craft. Like 
I have a rehearsal room over in Bushwick where I just go um, and just sing. I'll just go and sing for two hours. Not that I want to. (laughs) I don't want to go and like stand by myself and sing, but but it makes me feel good. It makes me know that when I'm going out on tour, I'm going to play some shows that I'm prepared. It's just like... um, I was, my little niece was um, doing all these crazy dance moves on FaceTime the other day and like high kicking and shit. And I'm like, do you stretch before you do that? And she's like, no. And I'm just like, oh yeah, that's just us. That's us old guys. And it's like, you know, if I went and played soccer, I haven't played soccer in two months because of this whole situation. I was in the studio. I play soccer on a team in my neighborhood. But if I tried to play soccer right now and just went hard for like an hour, I would not be able to walk the next day. And the same thing applies with your voice. You, you sit on your ass at home for like a few months and then you get on tour and play like six shows in a row. You're going to blow your voice out the first show because that muscle is just totally like in civilian mode, you know, you just got to take care of it. I really like, um, I've got a real fascination with stories. I was a real big fan of Bourdain. Like that, he was a big influence on me going out into the world and traveling and starting to create my own stories. Have you ever considered at any point doing a memoir or a retrospective or something like that and writing about, you know, your, your years on the road and the experiences that you've had? Come in. Uh, no, I haven't. I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think, um, I've never thought about doing that. I don't think I would. I, you know what I have thought about doing though? I don't, I don't think I would do that. I don't, I think it would be very presumptuous of me to think that, uh, there's enough people in this world that want to read a memoir by me. You know what I mean? Working class musician memoir isn't something that really happens, but what's something not against anybody who's, you know, any punk musicians who are thinking of writing a memoir, you should go ahead and do that. But I, I'm, I don't think I'm the one. Um, but what I would say, what I have thought about doing is doing a book where it's based around the songs and the lyrics. So me writing, having, choosing a bunch of entries and a bunch of songs from different projects, And one page could be um, kind of the lyrics of the song and the other page could be like, this is obviously just for the people that are super into my stuff and would be interested in that kind of thing. And the other page just kind of being like, telling where I was in my life, where certain lines came from, where the inspiration came from for the song, what this means, just giving people some nerdy information on each song. Because that's the kind of shit that I'm I'm interested in for like, the songwriters who I um, admire. That kind of thing I'd be into, but like writing like a memoir, no. I don't think I'll do that. Do you keep your own like personal show list or anything like that for the the shows you've played? No, I don't. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm what you call organized. (laughs) So I don't have anything. I've lost most of my like records and things that I kept throughout the years, like things that I, I, I would collect a little bit from tours, like memorabilia, things like that, like things that I've experienced, but I've lost most of that in either a fire and then a flood. Um, we had a fire in the original avalanche house. And then, um, when hurricane, uh, Irene came, um, it completely flooded my storage facility. So I lost everything. Whoa. So I don't really have anything. And so it's taught me, I've, I've accepted the idea of like, I don't like hold on to much. I just kind of let, I just kind of live and just live it and just live in the moment and not hold on to too much shit. Cause it, it always leaves me anyway. <laughs> Well, there's plenty, there's plenty from this to keep people busy for now. Uh, I'm going to link to everything in the show notes. And so people can find all those links directly. 
but mm-hmm. I definitely recommend people check in uh, on Thursdays and Sundays. I'll include a song or two within this episode too. So again, if there's any folks who are listening right now that haven't heard any of Vinny's bands, you could get it like get a taste that way. And then again, I'll link to everything so you can go check them out. Buy stuff, folks. Uh, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, buy stuff, obviously. I mean, there's GoFundMe's and stuff and, you know, not necessarily GoFundMe's, but different projects that are trying to help musicians right now. And, you know, uh, bartenders, uh, people doing day work and things like that. It's likely, you know, I even saw something about like Amoeba Music is saying like, hey, we need help. So, I mean, it's likely that some things after this are not going to be around anymore. Um, but we should, yeah. we should try to save everything that we can. So, um, I'll tell people if, if you like what you hear and I think you will to go out and buy stuff. I'll also do like a giveaway where, you know, I, whenever I have a musician on, on Vinny, people will know this by this point, but, um, I'll buy, uh, I'll ship a record to someone. Uh, I'll do some kind of contest in the intro, but, um, yeah. Cool. Just let them know, just let them know to hit me up on Instagram. You know, that's, that's how to keep in touch with anything that I'm, all the things that I'm doing and, and, um, no, it's cool. I appreciate that. Cool. Yeah. And, and you heard it people, um, uh, Go check him out on Instagram and I'll link to that. So that's a wrap on episode number 155 of the Voyages of Tim Vetter podcast. Thanks to Vinny for coming on. It was a great treat to get to talk to him. Thank you to you Voyagers as always for tuning in. If you're tuning in for the first time, thank you. Welcome to the family. I hope that you enjoy the episode and that you check out some more episodes. I'm going to play you out with one more song. And this is the movie life. The song is called Laugh Ourselves to Death. And it's their most recent record, Cities in Search of a Heart. Hope you like this one. Hope you like the first couple songs I played. I will catch all of you next time. And as always, please take care of each other. Bye-bye. Summer sun